Letter Eight of Letters from Egypt by Lady Lucy Duff Gordon, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. To Mrs. Austin, a few miles below Girga, March seventh, eighteen sixty-three. Dearest Mother, I was so glad to find from your letter, which Janet sent me to Thebes by a steamer, that mine from Siut had reached you safely. First and foremost, I am wonderfully better. In Cairo the winter has been terribly cold and damp, as the Coptic priest told me yesterday at Girga. So I don't repent the expense of the boat, for je n'ai pour mon argent. I am all the money better, and really think of getting well. Now that I know the ways of this country a little, which Herodotus truly says is like no other, I see that I might have gone and lived at Thebes, or Kenna, or Aswan, on next to nothing. But then how could I know it? The English have raised a mirage of false wants and extravagance, which the servants of the country, of course, some from interest and others from mere ignorance, do their best to keep up. As soon as I had succeeded in really persuading Omar that I was not as rich as a pasha, and had no wish to be thought so, he immediately turned over a new leaf as to what must be had and said, "Oh, if I could have thought an English lady would have eaten and lived and done the least like Arab people." I might have hired a house at Kenna for you, and we might have gone up in a clean passenger boat. But I thought no English could bear it. At Cairo, where we shall be, inshallah, on the nineteenth, Omar will get a lodging and borrow a few mattresses and a table and chair, and, as he says, keep the money in our pockets instead of giving it to the hotel. I hope Alec got my letter from Thebes, and that he told you that I had dined with the blameless Ethiopians. I have seen all the temples in Nubia and down as far as I have come, and nine of the tombs at Thebes. Some are wonderfully beautiful: Abu Simbel, Kalabshi, Kom Ambo, a little temple at El Kab, lovely. Three tombs at Thebes, and most of all Abydos, Edfu, and Dendera are the most perfect. Edfu quite perfect, but far less beautiful. But the most lovely objects my eyes ever saw is the island of Philae. It gives one quite the supernatural feeling of Claude's best landscapes, not only the least like them, Gans Anders. The Arabs say that Ans el Wogud, the most beautiful of men, built it for his most beautiful beloved, and there they lived in perfect beauty and happiness all alone. If the weather had not been so cold while I was there, I should have lived in the temple, in a chamber sculptured with the mystery of Osiris's burial and resurrection. Omar cleaned it out and meant to move my things there for a few days, but it was too cold to sleep in a room without a door. The winds have been extraordinarily cold this year and are so still. We have had very little of the fine warm weather and really have been pinched with cold most of the time. On the shore away from the river would be much better for invalids. Mustafa Aga, the consular agent at Thebes, has offered me a house of his. Up among the tombs in the finest air, if I ever want it, he was very kind and hospitable indeed to all the English there. I went into his harem and liked his wife's manners very much. It was charming to see that she henbecked her handsome old husband completely. They had fine children, and his boy, about thirteen or so, rode and played jarid one day when Abdallah Pasha had ordered the people of the neighborhood to do it for General Parker. I never saw so beautiful a performance. The old general and I were quite excited, and he tried it to the great amusement of the Sheikh El Balid. Some young Englishmen were rather grand about it, but declined mounting the horses and trying a throw. The Sheikh and young Hassan and then old Mustafa wheeled round and round like beautiful hawks, and caught the palm sticks thrown at them as they dashed round. It was superb, and the horses were good, though the saddles and bridles were rags and ends of rope, and the men mere tattered demilions. A little below Thebes, I stopped and walked inland to Kous to see a noble old mosque falling to ruin. No English had ever been there, and we were surrounded by a crowd in the bazaar. Instantly, five or six tall fellows with long sticks improvised themselves our bodyguard and kept the people off, who do rest were perfectly civil and only curious to see such strange harem, and after seeing us well out of the town, evaporated as quietly as they came without a word. I gave about ten pence to buy oil, as it is Ramadan and the mosque ought to be lighted, and the old servant of the mosque kindly promised me full justice at the day of judgment, 
as I was one of those Nurani of whom the Lord Mohammed said that they were not proud, and wish well to the Muslimin. The Pasha had confiscated all the lands belonging to the mosque, and allowed three hundred piastres, not two pounds a month, for all expenses. Of course the noble old building, with its beautiful carving and arabesque mouldings, must fall down. There was a smaller one beside it, where he declared that anciently forty girls lived unmarried and recited the Koran, Muslim nuns, in fact. I intend to ask the alim, for whom I have a letter from Mustafa, about such an anomaly. Some way above Beliana, Omar asked eagerly leave to stop the boat, as a great sheikh had called to us, and we should inevitably have some disaster if we disobeyed. So we stopped, and Omar said, Come and see the sheikh, ma'am. I walked off and presently found about thirty people, including all my own men, sitting on the ground round St. Simon's stylites, without the column. A hideous old man, like Polyphemus, utterly naked, with the skin of a rhinoceros all cracked with the weather, sat there, and had sat day and night, summer and winter, motionless for twenty years. He never prays, he never washes, he does not keep Ramadan, and yet he is a saint. Of course I expected a good hearty curse from such a man, but he was delighted with my visit, asked me to sit down, ordered his servant to bring me sugar cane, asked my name and tried to repeat it over and over again, and was quite talkative and full of jokes and compliments, and took no notice of any one else. Omar and my crew smiled and nodded, and all congratulated me heartily. Such a distinction proves my own excellence, as the sheikh knows all people's thoughts, and is sure to be followed by good fortune. Finally, Omar proposed to say the fada, in which all joined except the sheikh, who looked rather bored by the interruption, and desired us not to go so soon, unless I were in a hurry. A party of Bedouin came up on camels with presents for the holy man, but he took no notice of them, and went on questioning Omar about me, and answering my questions. What struck me was the total absence of any sanctimonious air about the old fellow. He was quite worldly and jocose. I suppose he knew that his position was secure, and thought his dirt and nakedness proved his holiness enough. Omar then recited the fatha again, and we rose and gave the servants a few fathas, the saint takes no notice of this part of the proceeding, but he asked me to send him twice my hand full of rice for his dinner, an honor so great that there was a murmur of congratulation through the whole assembly. I asked Omar how a man could be a saint who neglected all the duties of a Muslim, and I found that he fully believed that Sheikh Salim could be in two places at once, that while he sits there on the shore he is also at Mecca, performing every sacred function and dressed all in green. Many people have seen him there, ma'am, quite true. From Beliana we rode on pack donkeys without bridles to Abydos, six miles through the most beautiful crops ever seen. The absence of weeds and blight is wonderful, and the green of Egypt, where it is green, would make English green look black. Beautiful cattle, sheep, and camels were eating the delicious clover, while their owners camped there in reed huts during the time the crops are growing. Such a lovely scene, all sweetness and plenty. We ate our bread and dates in Osiris's temple, and a woman offered us buffalo milk on our way home, which we drank warm out of the huge earthen pan it had been milked in. At Girga I found my former friend Mishregi absent, but his servants told some of his friends of my arrival, and about seven or eight big black turbans soon gathered in the boat. A darling little Coptic boy came with his father and wanted a kitab, book to write in, so I made one with paper and the cover of my old pocket book, and gave him a pencil. I also bethought me of showing him pickies in a book, which was so glorious a novelty that he wanted to go with me to my town, Beled Inglais, where more such books were to be found. Siut, March 9th. I found here letters from Alec, telling me of dear Lord Lansdowne's death. Of course, I know that his time was come, but the thought that I shall never see his face again, that all that kindness and affection is gone out of my life, is a great blow. No friend could leave such a blank to me as that old and faithful one, though the death of younger ones might be more tragic, but so many things seem gone with him into the grave. Many, indeed, will mourn that kind, wise, steadfast man, and tuique fides. 
No one nowadays will be so noble with such unconsciousness and simplicity. I have bought two Coptic turbans to make a black dress out of. I thought I should like to wear it for him, here where compliment is out of the question. I also found a letter from Janet, who has been very ill. The account was so bad that I have telegraphed to hear how she is, and shall go at once to Alexandria if she is not better. If she is, I shall hold to my plan and see Beni Hassan and the pyramids on my way to Cairo. I found my kind friend, the Copt Wasif, kinder than ever. He went off to telegraph to Alexandria for me, and showed so much feeling and real kindness that I was quite touched. I was grieved to hear that you had been ill again, dearest mother. The best is that I feel so much better that I think I may come home again without fear. I still have an irritable cough, but it has begun to have lucid intervals, and is far less frequent. I can walk four or five miles, and my appetite is good. All this in spite of really cold weather in a boat where nothing shuts within two fingers' breadths. I long to be again with my own people. Please send this to Alec, to whom I will write again from Cairo. End of letter 8 Read by Sibella Denton All LibriVox files are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org.